Yes. Hello and welcome everyone for another Sussex Fusion talk. Once again, I would like to remind you that these talks are part of the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. It is a sharing platform that was created at the beginning of the COVID situation where neuroscientists from all fields and around the globe exchange about their work. So I really encourage you to check the WWN website. You will find plenty of ongoing and past talks that will probably interest you and your colleagues. So you will find all the necessary link in the description. Today, I'm glad to receive Evelyn Sarnagor from Newcastle University. Evelyn obtained her PhD from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, where she studied regeneration in cat spinal motor neurons. She then moved to the US for a postdoc position at the NIH, where she worked on the development on locomotor networks in chick embryo spinal cord. She then moved to California, where she worked on light response in developing turtles retina as a SNCC Kettlewell Eye Research Institute in San Francisco. Now she is based in the UK as a professor in retinal neuroscience, where her lab specializes in retinal plasticity in development and disease. Hello, Evelyn. How are you doing today? Hello, uh, Maxime. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank to you. So, do I share my screen now? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, here we are. Is that okay? Oh, no, not yet. There we go. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to present my work uh, in this forum. I think it's a fantastic initiative and allows us somehow to keep in contact in these difficult times. So today I would like to tell you about some very novel uh, uh, results from my lab. Uh, uh, that shows some quite compelling evidence that uh, there might be a very strong link between early neonatal spontaneous activity and uh, uh, angiogenesis. So, um, so as probably most of you know, uh, everywhere in the immature central nervous system, there is very intense spontaneous bursting activity. Uh, uh, around the time of uh, birth. Uh, and wherever it has been looked for, it has been found. I'm talking about the retina, spinal cord, cortex, hippocampus, etc. And of course, it takes different forms in different parts of uh, the CNS. Um, and there are many studies that show that uh, these early activities involved in neurite outgrowth, synaptogenesis, circuit formation. And very interestingly, uh, uh, so this activity is present only for relatively short and very well periods called critical periods uh, that occur long before sensory experience is even possible. And, but the refinement of neural circuitry uh, continues long after it disappears. So the question is whether that early activity before experience, sensory experience, could have additional roles uh, uh, yeah, during uh, the maturation of the CNS at early stages. Now, wherever it happens, uh, that spontaneous activity uh, uh, really uh, takes the form of very intense spontaneous bursting, in intense firing, which is metabolically very demanding. And neurons in general are the most metabolically demanding cells in the organism. So, uh, it, they are very reliant on oxygen supply from blood vessels. And it turns out that uh, uh, both the uh, neural and vascular networks uh, in, uh, develop early in development in tight just position during these short critical periods. And uh, they form what is called the neurovascular uh, unit. Uh, and here you can see in this diagram, you can see uh, uh, what the neurovascular unit consists of. So it consists of neurons, blood vessels, where you have endothelial cells, pericytes, basal membranes, uh, uh, and uh, astrocytes, and microglia. So all these uh, components uh, uh, make uh, form uh, the neurovascular unit that allows communication between the neurons and the blood vessels. Uh, 
so the question is where, whether these early, very strong uh, hotspots of activity could attract growing blood vessels. And here you can see spontaneous activity in, uh, the, uh, in the immature retina. So you have this very strong burst of activity. And the rationale for thinking that is that intense impulse activity will result in local hypoxia that is due to high oxygen consumption that is necessary to activate ATP dependent transporters that will restore ionic concentrations to resting levels. And uh, hypoxia triggers angiogenesis via upregulation of uh, transcription factors called hypoxia inducible transcription factors or HIF. Um, and uh, in the retina, for instance, uh, HIF1 uh, upregulates the production of vascular endothelial growth factor or VEGF, which is released from astrocytes and that promotes angiogenesis. So uh, uh, as I think all of you know, um, uh, in, the, in the immature retina, uh, ganglion cells uh, generate spontaneous bursts of activity that are correlated between neighbors and that results in waves that propagate uh, across the ganglion cell layer. And in mouse, which is the model I'm going to talk uh, to you uh, today about, uh, so gestation lasts about 21 days during which the retina will develop from the optic vesicles and the optic cup. And then, <clears throat> sorry, the spontaneous waves are going to start very shortly before birth. Initially, uh, they are mediated by gap junctions. Uh, so these are the stage one waves. And then immediately after birth, they become uh, driven by uh, acetylcholine, by cholinergic connection from the starburst amatin cells. These are the stage two waves. And then uh, once the glutamatergic synapses from bipolar cells mature, uh, the wave control switches from acetylcholine to glutamate. And that will occur at postnatal day 10. So these are the stage three glutamatergic waves. And then the spontaneous waves will disappear at eye opening around P12, so that there won't be any uh, 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 interactions between the spontaneous activity and visual experience. Now, now during that entire period of spontaneous activity, uh, we know, I mean, I mean, we know that this entire period is a critical period for activity dependent wiring of the visual system. And, but what I would like uh, to talk about today is uh, I, I want to investigate whether uh, uh, there is also activity dependent angiogenesis during that period. So what about angiogenesis in the mouse retina? Uh, so um, you can see here the developmental uh, progression of, uh, well, first of all, of uh, uh, cell birth, uh, proliferation, and, and, and angiogenesis here. So birth is here, this is embryonic, this is postnatal. And before birth, the retina is completely avascular, no blood vessels in the retina. And then it starts exactly at birth. You have a, a blood vessel that will enter the retina through the optic nerve head, and they will propagate in the ganglion cell layer. So this is the superficial plexus. And um, so here you can see that, so we have labeled, uh, uh, you can label blood vessels with isolecting B4. And here you can see the, that superficial vasculature as prodnatal day three, four, five, and six. And you see that it grows uh, uh, with development. And you can see the outline of the retina here. So, the blood vessels, I mean, that superficial vasculature will reach the periphery by P8. And then after that, you are going to have, uh, when the Müller cells mature, uh, they will guide uh, blood vessels to uh, plunge into, to start forming the deep plexus here. So that will start uh, uh, from P9 to about P12. And after that, finally, uh, there will be the formation of intermediate vessels here. And of course, at the same time, you also have maturation of uh, 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 the, the, the retina uh, blood barrier here. 
so uh, if so, so the 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 plexus grows uh, with development, and then if we look at uh, the uh, changes in blood vessel branching, which can be do done using a Scholl analysis, <coughs> where uh, uh, and that's on the image J. So basically, the the algorithm uh, grows concentric circles all around uh, uh, the vasculature, starting from the optic nerve head to the end. And then uh, it counts the number of intersections from blood vessels on every one of these concentric circles. And this is what is plotted here for uh, four retinas, uh, P3, P4, P5, and P6. So well, you can see that uh, uh, the radius of uh, the plexus increases but you see that uh, there is more and more, uh, there are more and more uh, 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 branches also. And uh, reaching a peak value at about, uh, around two thirds of uh, uh, the length of uh, the plexus. And then there is a, a sharp drop. <clears throat> so angiogenesis coincides with the period of retinal waves. So that brings us to think that maybe uh, the waves could drive angiogenesis, going back to that hypothesis I presented to you earlier, that uh, uh, angiogenesis may be uh, driven by hypoxia due to a uh, strong uh, neural activity. And uh, so the superficial plexus, uh, which starts uh, at P1 uh, and reaches the periphery at P8, occurs, uh, coincides exactly with the period of the stage two cholinergic waves. And then uh, the deep plexus uh, begins at the, at the end of the cholinergic waves, but also overlaps with uh, um, the glutamatergic stage three waves. So uh, I have, there is only one paper that I know about that has looked at that. And it's a paper that was published last year in Nature Communication. This is a group from uh, 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 Seoul, from San Diego, uh, Seoul or UC San Diego, I can't remember. Anyway, they have manipulated the cholinergic activity in uh, neonatal mice and uh, using various approaches, uh, genetic and pharmacological approaches, and found that it impairs the deep plexus development and also the blood retina barrier but not the superficial plexus that uh, develops immediately after birth. So the question is whether there is some non-cholinergic specific activity, uh, neural activity that may be involved in angiogenesis in the superficial plexus. And so here I need to introduce you uh, to uh, this uh, very uh, serendipitous discovery that was done by Jean de Montigny, who has a PhD in my lab. Uh, so Jean was looking at the development of uh, starburst amacrysen mosaics. So he used a, a, a choline acetyltransferase antibody to label the starburst amacrine cells, and then looked at retinal hole mounts. So he could uh, calculate the density of the cells at different stages of development. And then to his amazement, to our amazement, he found these cellular clusters, uh, very large cells uh, that seem to label for choline acetyltransferase, uh, which is shown in green here. And so they, these cells form an annulus around the optic nerve head. And uh, that annulus expands with development. So you can see a P2, P3, P5, and they reach the periphery by uh, P7 or P8. And here you can see the progression uh, so of uh, these clusters from center to periphery. Um, uh, so uh, just by calculating the ratio of the distance from the cluster to the optic nerve head to uh, the distance between the optic nerve head and the periphery. And you see that as development progresses, the clusters are moving uh, uh, further and further towards the periphery. And the biggest, the most pronounced changes occur uh, between P3 and P4 and, and then P6, and then it stabilizes. And from P8, uh, the, the cluster cells begin to disintegrate. 
and they completely disappear by P10. They are not, you can't see it anymore. Yeah, uh, um, and so it, they coincide with the end of the cholinergic waves. So of course, our, our first cash, uh, question when we initially discovered these cells, what, what are these cells? So uh, based on immunolabeling, we initially thought that they were cholinergic ganglion cells uh, because they show the signal with the cholinacetyl transferase and also with our BPMS, which is the uh, antibody used to label ganglion cells. But then <laughs> much more recently, and by more recently, I mean, because the, Jean initially discovered these cells in January 2019, and then uh, uh, this past March, about two, three weeks before we went into lockdown, uh, uh, we realized that the cells are actually autofluorescent. And this was uh, uh, discovered by uh, Vidya Krishnamurti in the lab. Um, so that means that all the um, immunolabeling that we had done really is kind of meaningless and their identity remains elusive. So, um, so what we know is that they are in the ganglion cell layer. So here, well, here we use the chat antibody, although they, they fluoresce at many different wavelengths. Uh, even if you don't use any antibody, you will see them. And I will show you that on another picture later. But so you see the cluster cells here in the ganglion cell layer together with the starburst amacrine cells in green and then uh, the ganglion cells in red. But then if you go further down to the inner nuclear layer, you see only starburst amacrine cells. So they are in the ganglion cell layer. And you can see that here, that's the same area in this little uh, animation. And since initially we thought that they were cholinergic, we wanted to, to see whether they express uh, the vesicular acetylcholine transporter, VASHT, and uh, which you can see here. You can see very nicely the plexus formed uh, by the starburst amacrine cells using VASHT. And I mean, so, so you can see that the cluster cells seem to make very intimate contacts uh, with the starburst amacrine cells. But so the only certainty we have from this is that uh, they are in the ganglion cell layer um, and they seem to make contact with other cells. Uh, but we don't know what they are. So are they a, a subtype of transient ganglion cells? We don't know that yet. Now, so the cluster cells and the superficial vascular plexus expand simultaneously during the, the period of stage two cholinergic waves. So is there a link between them? And yes, there is a very strong link. It turns out that the clusters localize, co-localize precisely with the edge of the vasculature. So here you can see the clusters. Uh, and then here you can see uh, the blood vessels in the same uh, retina. And here is the overlap. So they are uh, just underneath the edge of the vasculature, although we never see them ahead of the vasculature. And that's actually a, could be an important point for discussion later. And not only that, but they expand in synchrony. Uh, so as uh, both of them move to the uh, periphery at the same rate, so that the clusters are always seen exactly under the outer edge of the growing vasculature. And so what about the stage two waves? Uh, I mean, all the studies that have been done on waves by many people uh, suggest that the, the cholinergic waves uh, are initiated in random locations. And there have been also some nice modeling about that. Um, but all the experimental data that shows that has been using uh, uh, only limited areas of the retina to record the waves, either with uh, calcium imaging or with multi-electrode arrays, uh, arrays that do not cover the entire retina. But so maybe the origins are not random. Maybe they also follow some centrifugal developmental pattern. Um, and uh, so we record waves from the ganglion cell layer using uh, a large scale high density multi-electrode array. Uh, uh, and some of you who are listening to this talk have that same system. So this is a system from TreeBrain. Uh, so 
uh, that array has 4,096 electrodes, and it really provides a pan-retinal perspective of network activity at fantastic spatial temporal resolution. And here you can see a corner of that array. Uh, so here you can see individual electrodes, where here the electrode pitch is 42 micron. And on top of it, there is a retina with uh, uh, Thai one expressing ganglion cells, uh, expressing some uh, green fluorescent protein. So you can visualize the cell. So you can see that uh, these electrodes really give uh, near uh, cellular resolution. And uh, so we, we use this system to uh, record retinal waves. But then the, the, the thing is that, you know, with that, that array, with the four, uh, 42 uh, micrometer pitch, you cannot cover the whole retina. Uh, but uh, TreeBrain has other arrays uh, with an electrode pitch of 81 micrometer. And uh, so the spatial resolution is lower, but the advantage is that the entire retina sits on the active electrode. And you can see that here, this is a P6 retina. And you can see here the outline of the retina lying on the array, ganglion cell layer facing down on the electrode. And you can see uh, the waves that, uh, where they're initiated and how they propagate across the array. So that allows us to see all the waves that are generated in the retina. And <clears throat> so um, using that approach, well, we're using an a, a analysis that uh, we published in uh, 2014 in a paper where we looked at the ontogeny of uh, uh, retinal waves, but published in the Journal of Physiology six years ago. And uh, so we can, we can uh, quantify a lot of wave parameters and we can also localize their origins. Um, so this is what we used for uh, this project here using the big array, the, the array that encompasses the whole uh, retina. Um, and uh, so we can, uh, we can measure, uh, we can localize the origin of every wave. So we, we call for half an hour or an hour, and then we process the data. And when you can see here is a retina just post recording photographed on the MEA. Um, and then after that, of course, we do the, the analysis. And then once we have the wave origin, which are the little green dots here, we can overlay the two images. So we can see exactly where uh, uh, the waves uh, originate from. And then uh, uh, to quantify where the wave origins are in terms of center uh, versus periphery, we draw an ellipse around the outer edge of the retina and then a, a concentric one, which is half size. And then uh, we count how many wave origins, which are these little dots here in the central part with that the gray mask, as opposed to uh, the peripheral part. And we take only uh, the areas that are covered by the retina, because of course we have tails in the retina to flatten it. So there is, uh, so we use only the parts that are covered by the retina. So, and then we can calculate the ratio of wave origins between uh, periphery and center. And that's what you can see here. Um, and we have done that uh, from P2 to uh, P13 to eye opening. And in blue, you see the, the uh, stage two cholinergic waves, green is the uh, glutamatergic waves. And what you see here is the periphery versus center ratio. And as you can see, there is a very strong uh, developmental change. And, uh, uh, and again, with a, a, a very big uh, change occurring between P3 and P4. And then uh, around that time, uh, the ratio uh, reaches values that are above one, meaning that there are more waves originating from the periphery than from the center. And then later on, uh, uh, that ratio really disappears and it's certainly not there anymore uh, during the glutamatergic waves, which are a completely different beast. I mean, there are small hotspots of activity that tile uh, the retina. Uh, so, that suggests that uh, there is a, a very strong trend from uh, center to periphery. Uh, 
And, and just to verify that, uh, more recently, what uh, uh, Jean did was uh, 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 Monte Carlo randomization of the wave origins uh, for every retina, uh, repeating that uh, 10 times, and then, calculate, and then we calculate the ratio. And by doing that, we completely lose that trend. You know, on average, we always find a, a, a ratio that is around one, meaning that uh, uh, the origins are equally uh, distributed between center and periphery. So in real life, we find that uh, uh, the wave origins are, are not random at all. They, they really follow a center to periphery pattern, just like the cell clusters and like the blood vessels. Um, and uh, so just to summarize that, so we see synchronized centrifugal progression of the superficial vasculature, uh, the clusters, and the waves. And then uh, I, I just, when I was preparing this talk, I just went back to uh, data uh, that we published in, in our 2014 paper, where we looked at the size of the waves uh, measure either as the center of activity trajectory length or the area of the waves. We find that, uh, so these are postnatal days here, and we find that, again, they reach peak size around P6, P7, and then, and then they decrease in size. And amazingly, you can see that in all cases, you see that there is a strong change occurring between P3 and P4, um, and then, and then after that, there is a decrease. And of course, uh, uh, after P7, and of course, in the case of the clusters, it's not that you have a decrease, but the clusters simply disappear. They disintegrate. Um, so could the cluster cells trigger the wave onset? Uh, and so this is uh, when we started a, a very nice uh, collaboration. <coughs> with Tim Golish's lab. Uh, so this analysis was done by Fernando Rosenblit in Tim's lab. So uh, what Fernando did is electrical imaging uh, during uh, the waves. So basically he did spike trigger averaging of the electrical signals uh, in all the neighboring uh, channels and taking into consideration only uh, spikes that are uh, convincingly part of waves because there is, of course, also some random activity. So here you can see uh, one channel where, I mean, this is the spike that is used for uh, STA, and this is the spike here. And then in quite a few channels, like, like this one here, you see that on, on some adjacent channels, there is some dipole activity. Uh, what does it mean? It means that there is a positive deflection uh, that, that has a Z-score above five, uh, that occurs before a smaller negative deflection. Um, and uh, so all the cells, uh, uh, I mean, the electrodes, where this was detected uh, in this particular retina are indicated with this green mask here. So, uh, so could they reflect activity in the cluster cells? I mean, they are smaller, uh, uh, the signals are smaller, so they could they could uh, represent some graded potentials. I mean, not a spike. We, we don't know exactly what happened. And here you can see a time-lapse movie of the same. So you see that uh, this dipole activity occurs at the same time as the spikes, and you can see it very clearly. So this is the time of, uh, this is the, the time for the STA here, uh, uh, time zero. But many other channels do not show that. They show only a, a negative, deflections of smaller amplitude around the STA, the channel used for STA. Uh, so these are presumably just uh, reflecting propagating spikes during a wave. So how do these regions with positive dipoles relate to wave origins that like I've shown you a couple of slides back? Um, <clears throat> so this is shown here for four retinas, two P4 and two P5 retinas. Uh, uh, each one, for each case, we, we called it one retina with, an, it, uh, with a large MEA, which the advantage is that uh, we can record from the entire retina. 
but the spatial resolution is not as good as uh, the one with the smaller pitch that you have here. And so in green, you see the wave origins that were uh, the wave that occurred during that one hour recording. And then what you see overlapped here, overlaid on uh, uh, the wave origins is the pixels, the uh, XY locations where uh, there was a significant positive deflection preceding the time of a negative deflection. So in other, in other words, these significant dipole uh, uh, signals. And as you can see, there is a pretty good uh, 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 correlation between uh, the location of the wave origins and uh, these dipoles here. Uh, and it's probably easier to see in uh, uh, the case in, in the retina that were recorded with the higher spatial resolution like this one and this one here. On the other hand, if now uh, uh, they plot all the projections over all electrodes, regardless of whether there is a, a positive dipole, you see that uh, the correlation is much more blurred here. There are many more uh, electrodes that uh, uh, show a signal here. So it may be that uh, uh, this dipole does reflect uh, activity in the cluster cells. Now, um, if uh, uh, the cluster cells trigger uh, uh, spontaneous activity and that induces uh, hypoxia, so we would expect the hypoxic conditions to be strong in the area of the clusters near the growing tips of the blood vessels. So what we have done here is, uh, and I hope you can see it because uh, I'm not sure how good the video is, I can certainly see it very well on my screen here at home, as uh, we have uh, used an antibody against the uh, hypoxia inducing factor one alpha. And it's the, all these green specks here. And so here you see uh, cluster cells and the blood vessels in magenta, and then all the green specks here uh, is the HIF uh, one alpha. And you see that there is a very strong expression in uh, uh, the vicinity of uh, uh, the cluster cells. And the other thing that we can see here is that there is a very pronounced decreasing gradient uh, from these area toward the periphery to areas of the retina where there is no vasculature yet. So that does suggest that uh, there is hypoxia around uh, the cluster cells and, and at the growing tip of the blood vessels. Um, so uh, the question is, so if, if, if activity uh, promotes angiogenesis and the clusters are basically the, the, where the, the activity originates from, so you would expect angiogenesis to be more pronounced in the area of the clusters. And this is a very nice uh, work that was done by Courtney Thorne, an MRE student who was in the lab this year. Uh, so what Courtney did, uh, she did some shoal analysis uh, in retinal segments going from the optic nerve head to the periphery. And uh, she did it, uh, she, she looked at the number of intersections on the concentric circles, but only in the outer half of this segment because that's, that's where the clusters are. The clusters are no, not near the optic nerve head. And she has done that in areas with clusters and uh, areas without clusters at the same eccentricity. And what she found is that uh, at every age she has done that, uh, she, she found that the areas with the, where there were clusters, so C plus, always had a, a, a higher vascular density, meaning more intersections uh, of blood vessels on the, on the shoal circles than in uh, uh, areas at the same eccentricity, but without clusters. So this is true in all, at all ages where it was done. And here you can see the pool data. Uh, so there is more angiogenesis under the clusters. So, they disappear, these cells completely vanish by P10. So how do they disappear? 
Well, it turns out that they undergo uh, microglial phagocytosis. So here you can see uh, cluster cells in, I mean, here they are actually used without any antibody. Uh, this is just like uh, uh, autofluorescence and uh, overlaid with uh, um, uh, uh, labeling for microglia uh, using uh, uh, the IBA1 antibody. So microglia are the resident macrophages of the CNS. And, um, and so this is very different from ganglion cells because ganglion cells in the neonatal retina, I mean, the majority of ganglion cells die of programmed cell death or apoptosis. So 70 to 80 percent of ganglion cells will disappear in mouse in the first postnatal week. Uh, but we haven't seen any sign of apoptosis. So we should probably do more of that. We haven't done, we haven't looked at that very much in detail so far. Um, and uh, but you can, so, so microglia are extremely dynamic cells uh, and they change shape uh, in different conditions. So this is a resting microglia here that you can see. So they have this elongated shape with a few processors, but once they're activated and, and they engulf cells, they become much rounder and with shorter processors. And you can see that here. Now, interestingly, and you see that most of the cluster cells are surrounded by the microglia. Uh, and interestingly, we find that the intensity of the fluorescence in the cluster cells appears anticorrelated to the level of phagocytosis. So here, for instance, you see uh, cells that are very bright, and, but you don't see any sign of microglia around them. While some other cells here uh, have a much faint, fainter signal and are completely surrounded by uh, microglial cells. And you can see that everywhere. Um, and uh, where well, it looks like the cluster cells actually attract microglia. And here in these two uh, micrographs here, you can see that very nicely. I mean, here, the, so the microglia are labeled in orange here, blood vessels in magenta, and then in green, whitish, we have the cluster cells. And you can already see that there are more microglia near the cluster cells. And again, uh, Courtney has uh, quantified that. Uh, and it turns out that uh, the, the density of microglia is significantly higher uh, in areas uh, where there are clusters than in er areas of the same eccentricity, but without clusters. And not only that, but she found this beautiful positive correlation between the density of the cluster cell, because not all clusters have the same density. Here you see, for instance, a cluster with a high density and here one with a lower density. So she found that there is a, a, a nice positive correlation between the density of the cluster cells and the density of uh, microglia. And she also found that uh, the only place where uh, 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 the microglial density is significantly higher is in the cluster area. So the way she did that was by uh, uh, drawing uh, axes going from the optic nerve head uh, to the periphery and dividing those into four areas, um, one containing a cluster and one ahead of the cluster further in the periphery one just behind the cluster and one near the optic nerve head. And she has done that in areas with clusters or areas without clusters. And this is what you can see here. So, um, uh, and she find that the, the only other clusters, there, there are significantly more uh, microglia in areas with clusters than in uh, uh, areas without clusters at the same eccentricity. Everywhere else, there is no difference. So, uh, so again, it looks like the, the cluster cells are really attracting uh, microglia in their vicinity. So finally, I um, uh, wanted to know, I said, well, maybe these cluster cells are some specialized ganglion cells. So what would chronic changes in uh, uh, neonatal uh, activity in the ganglion cell layer uh, 
uh, if we if we can change that chronically, how would it affect angiogenesis and the clusters? So uh, luckily, we have in the lab uh, a mouse model that is used for another project that was just perfect for that. And uh, this is a model where the majority of ganglion cells, so these are brn 3 b expressing uh, ganglion cell, which is about 70 to 80 percent of the entire ganglion cell population, express excitatory designer receptor exclusively activated by designer drugs or dreads. So these excitatory dreads are dreads GQ. So this is pharmacogenetics. Uh, and so these dread GQs uh, uh, are activated when uh, a designer drug uh, binds to them. And the one we use is clozapine N oxide or CNO, which has no endogenous receptors in the retina. And uh, so when dread expressing ganglion cells uh, 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 sense CNO, they will depolarize and fire like crazy. And the nice thing is that uh, the effect is prolonged and uh, CNO can be applied systemically for chronic studies. And here you can see um, um, in, uh, so this is done in vitro. Uh, here you can see uh, waves in a P6 retina. So here you see the raster plot. Uh, over all uh, active electrodes uh, using the big MEA. So here, uh, each one of those represents a wave. And here you can see uh, uh, the average firing rate during each wave. And then if we add CNO to the same retina, we find that the wave uh, frequency increases and there is a lot more uh, background activity also. So there is a lot more activity in the ganglion cell layer. So. What we have done is uh, inject CNO uh, chronically in pups from birth to P6 and then sacrifice them at P6 and look at uh, the blood vessels and the clusters. And again, these are very preliminary results. Um, sorry, here we are. So here we can see, so these are all, uh, these are uh, both uh, uh, P6 retinas from the same litter. Uh, and the top is one uh, where uh, there were dreads in the brn 3 b expressing ganglion cell. And uh, in this one, down, they weren't. So this is a control liter mate, no dreads. And as you can see, and you can see the outline of the retina here, as you can see, the plexus is, uh, the, the growth of the plexus is somehow aborted. Um, it doesn't grow as far as it should. Uh, uh, when there is uh, more activity. And, um, and you see that the clusters are still remaining uh, under uh, the edge of the vasculature, although they, they seem to be much more spread out. Um, and uh, so there is definitely an effect uh, on, on, the, on the vasculature and on the clusters when you increase activity in the ganglion cell layer, which will of course uh, uh, um, uh, increase the amount of uh, hypoxia. And, uh, and then again, so if we look, so not only uh, the, the, the plexus is shorter, but there is also more proliferation of blood vessels, as you can see here. So here you have, so these are four uh, retinas from the same, uh, from, from, from four, sorry, from, Four pups from the same litter, so two uh, with uh, that were dread positive and two dread negative. So you can see that the plexus is shorter, and you see, but you see that uh, the peak uh, branching is higher uh, in the dread positive. So shorter plexus and more branches, um, and you can see that here as well. Here, just putting all the maximum number of intersection is higher in uh, the dread positive uh, retinas. So this was done by Courtney and uh, by Dia, another MRES uh, student in the lab. So to summarize, so we have discovered the transient population of cellular clusters in uh, the neonatal retina. And so far, uh, so the current evidence suggests that, first of all, that these cells may be electrically active and trigger the spontaneous waves. 
that there may be a specialized transient population of ganglion cells, that they may guide angiogenesis in the superficial vascular plexus by generating hypoxic conditions, and that they may send an eat me signal to microglia once growing blood vessels reach them. Because if they really generate very intense activity, I mean, this is metabolically very expensive. So if their, if their role is to attract blood vessels, once the blood vessels have reached them, you don't need them anymore. So you want to get rid of them. And then uh, chronic increase in activity levels in the ganglion cell layer during the, the first postnatal week hinders the vasculature development, but at the same time promotes angiogenesis by increasing the number of uh, uh, branches in these shorter plexuses. And actually there is a published evidence that shows that the retinal superficial vasculature does not develop at all in the absence of ganglion cells. Uh, so this has been shown in uh, the MAT5 knockout retina, where there are, I think, less than 5% of ganglion cells, and there is no vasculature. The, the, these retinas remain avascular. Uh, also in the brn 3 b knockout, uh, when you call knockout brn 3 b you have only 30 or 30%, 20 or 30% of uh, ganglion cells. Um, and then uh, in... Uh, a disorder in humans which is called anencephaly, uh, which is a developmental defect of the cerebral cortex that results from the failure of the closure of the anterior neural tube. Uh, well, in neonates, uh, it turns out that, well, they have no ganglion cells and no vasculature also. <clears throat> so these cluster cells may provide the first evidence that they are specialized transient neuronal populations uh, in the CNS that guide angiogenesis uh, through uh, neural activity. And of course, uh, I think what I've presented you probably opens more questions uh, than answers questions. So first of all, we still don't know what is the cellular identity of these cells. And we're going to have to do a single cell uh, uh, sequencing to find that out. We don't know why they autofluoresce. Uh, so suggestions are that it could be lipofusin, which is expressed uh, by cells uh, uh, and it can be a sign of stress. And it may be that these cluster cells are initially not fluorescent and that they become, uh, when they are, let's say, most active uh, and that they become fluorescent only when uh, uh, they are contacted by, by uh, the blood vessels and the microglia. We don't know that. And the only way we will be able to tell that is by uh, combining uh, imaging together with uh, uh, activity recordings. And we, of course, we need also to find uh, 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 more direct evidence for uh, involvement in, in retinal waves. And again, that, that uh, will have to be done uh, using imaging. And then we need to understand the cell signaling mechanism that link the neural activity, angiogenesis, and the disappearance of these cells. And then finally, uh, and very importantly, uh, these cells might be linked to a, uh, uh, to a disorder called retinopathy of prematurity, which is a devastating disorder that often can lead to blindness. Uh, and it, uh, it's a, a disorder that, um, that is due to abnormally high exposure to oxygen in premature infants. Um, so it would be very interesting to see whether there is a link between these cells and what they do to angiogenesis and, uh, and the retinopathy of prematurity. And you know, if we understand better uh, what's happening there, you know, this could eventually lead to uh, a cure, which would be fantastic, of course. Um, so I just want to thank the great people who have been involved in this project. So Jean de Montigny uh, discovered the clusters and he did all the initial immunolabeling, which turned out not to be very useful, unfortunately, but we didn't know. Uh, and he was also involved in the recordings. And then I was very lucky to have three wonderful uh, master students in the lab this year, 
mostly working on image analysis from home during the lockdown. So Kopni, Dia, and Dimitris Busula Sertedakis. And then uh, Vidya Krishnamurti, postdoc in the lab, was also involved in the project. Um, and then I would like to thank Robert Jackson and Gerrit Hilgen in the lab for some technical help. And then very interesting discussions with uh, a local colleague, Gavin Florian Linda Laco. And then with ophthalmologists, mostly Roxane Illier, who is a local uh, ophthalmologist who specializes in retinopathy of prematurity. And, She's very excited about this project. And then the bioimaging unit, uh, and it's thanks to the, all the beautiful kits that we were able to take all these nice pictures. And then in Göttingen, Fernando Rosenblit and Tim Golish for all the fantastic day work, work they did with the electrical imaging. And then I would like to give very special thanks to Jeremy Kay from Duke uh, because uh, uh, I presented this, uh, this data exactly a year ago at SFN in Chicago, and, but I knew nothing about blood vessels at that time. I just presented the clusters and, and the correlations with the waves and uh, uh, Jeremy came to see my poster and we had a very in interesting discussion. And he's the one who told me, well, you know, it's very interesting because the, the angiogenesis occurs at exactly the same time. It's, it, to, to follow exactly the same time course. And I had no idea because, uh, because I've, I never had any interest in blood vessels, I have to admit. And, but as soon as I got back home, uh, I started reading and feeling the immense gaps in my knowledge. And I think I've learned a lot in the past year about that. And, uh, and it's really thanks to Jeremy that uh, this project has uh, progressed the way it has. So thank you, Jeremy. And uh, then I would like to thank the funders. Uh, uh, Newcastle University was funded all the students and the BBSRC. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, that's it. So I'm ready to take questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you very much. That was a beautiful talk with lots of beautiful pictures and data. Um, so very excited to uh, be leading the questions now. Um, Maxime has become in this post, hence you see me. Um, so there's quite a few questions. Um, and I think, why don't we go through them? I, I actually have one myself, but I'm gonna skip that till the end. So the first question is from Marvin uh, Seifert here in Brighton. Is the activity in the regions into which the wave prog waves progress reduced directly after a wave has happened or passed through that area? So say that again, that where the... the so, where so the idea is you've got a wave and he's asking is if the Gambian cells um, where the wave was passing through, if they are suppressed after the wave has gone through. You mean if they go into a refractory period? Yeah, something like that. Uh, no, I, I, no, not really, but well, for how long? Quite a time. I mean, I think the reason he's asking that is because in our work, we see that sometimes. Yeah. Um, it's not very strong. And, you know, and, and then, you know, in the pharmacogenetics, you know, when we use the excitatory dread, I mean, we see activity all the time, you know, and, and uh, so, <laughs> well, I know that, you know, many people uh, believe that there is a very, very strong refractory period in the waves. I have to admit, we have not been able to see that uh, in our recordings. And I know I'm not very popular when I say that, but you know, these are, this is what we see. And um, uh, yeah, okay, oh, yes. Okay, so um, I, think, I think that certainly answers that. So um, we've got second question by uh, Serena Richet. Rich, um, okay, I'm not going to tr try to pronounce that name. <laughs> I'm sorry, Serena. Did you try to see if they don't disappear if you have a depletion of uh, microglia cells? Uh, by they, I think she means the uh, the blood vessels. So, if there is depletion of blood vessels of uh, microglia. No, if you have a microglia uh, depletion, if the blood vessels then don't disappear. That's I don't how I understand know. That. Uh, I don't know yet. You know, I mean, this is, uh, there are many things I don't know yet because this is all, it's all very preliminary. And obviously 
now I'm in the process of trying to get funding to take this project much further. Um, so okay. there are many, many unanswered questions. Okay, great. So then we've got one from Marla Feller. Uh, Jeremy K published that astrocytes follow RGC and uh, RGCs and guide angiogenesis. Do you know what astrocytes look like around the cluster? Well, uh, yes, we have labeled retinas uh, uh, for astrocytes and we don't really see any, I mean, the astrocytes are there before uh, everything else. You know, I mean, they, they, they form like, you know, like runways. Uh, they, they penetrate, uh, they invade the retina long before uh, the clusters and, and, and the blood vessels. Uh, and we haven't been able to see anything compelling, uh, you know, like anything special about the cluster areas in the astrocytes. Okay. But, you know, certainly to be followed. But, you know, at first, no, we don't see anything. Oh, great. So actually the next one is, is, a, is a comment by Steve Massey on, on my question. So I'm gonna ask my question and then read out his comment as well. So my question was, um, if you've compared your results from the mouse with other species, um, well, A in primate, of course, which has obvious applications, but then the other one is in species where there are no blood vessels in the eye, like in birds. And then Steve points out that they also don't have them in the rabbit, which of course is a very good yeah. point. Uh, well. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, so I think, well, you have chick embryos, right? Sure. So yeah. maybe you could, uh, all you have to do is, uh, is you know, just, just, just look at uh, retinal whole mounts and you don't even need to, <laughs> to use any antibodies or anything. I mean, just see if there are autofluorescent cells. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, but, you know, well, I'm not saying that these cluster cells might be the only way to drive the spontaneous activity. And, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, the mechanisms are different in different species. And, you know, like, I mean, I've worked on the turtle retina for a long time and, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, so these are a vascular as well. And well, there, I mean, you know, there is complete overlap between uh, the, cholinergic and glutamatergic activity. And, you know, it's, a, I don't know. So this, this may be something that is really uh, 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 unique to mammals, but I cannot tell you, but it will be very interesting uh, to test that. But I think that, you know, what I, what I find really amazing is that uh, the spontaneous activity is really present everywhere in the developing CNS taking different forms and it, it's present during such, you know, it has very specific patterns in different areas. And, uh, and, 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 um, uh, and it's present only during very limited periods. And, and we know that this is the period during which the blood vessels grow as well. So it, it may well be, the thing is that it's more difficult to study angiogenesis in other parts of the CNS uh, because uh, vasculature grows in, a, in three dimensions. And uh, so it's very, it's difficult to visualize. And until I became interested in, in uh, retinal vasculature, uh, you know, I didn't realize that is actually a classic model to study angiogenesis because, you know, everything is planar and it's easy to study. So many people use the retina as a model. So very lucky. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, you know, there may be, I mean, so for instance, in the cortex, uh, you, we, there are the, the uh, subplate uh, neurons, which are transient, and they are there, and we know that they, are, they participate in, in, uh, uh, in spontaneous activity, they are extremely active, and they really guide uh, cinematic formation, but then they disappear. So, you know, they may also be there to, uh, to guide uh, angiogenesis. I don't know. So it would be very nice to try to expand that to other systems also. So, yeah. so many questions. <laughs> Absolutely. It's only the tip of the iceberg, I think. Yeah. yeah I, I, mean, I, I, mean. I like the fact that everything can be somehow linked, you know, like everything happens in concert. It makes so much sense, you know, and you try to make use of, what you have for different purposes. And uh, 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I've got um, one more question by by Hugo uh, Caligaro, and after that, I think we will close this official part, and we will invite everyone uh, into the Zoom who wants to hang out afterwards. Marla is already okay. there. Um, and uh, yes, so let's just ask Hugo's question. So um, what he's asking is uh, recent papers from Dr. R uh, Richard Lang suggest a role of melanopsin and neuropsin, both expressed in the RGCs, in angiogenesis and hyaloid regression. Could the yes. process you describe uh, be light, light dependent? Yes, that, uh, that there is a very nice paper in Nature. I think that, I suppose that the paper they are referring to, uh, and, and uh, yes, and so it looks like, uh, uh, but that happens mostly before birth. It looks like, um, uh, well, there is, you know, light that, that is coming uh, uh, to the womb uh, from, uh, uh, from outside. And, and that light is sufficient to uh, activate the IPRGCs. And, you know, so they will generate activity. So, uh, and, oh, yes, because, uh, of course, there are some, what, what I haven't told you is that, there are some, uh, uh, you know, like embryonic uh, blood vessels, the hyaluronic blood vessels, uh, and but these uh, retract from the retina at birth and give uh, space for the the what is we mature into the the the, uh, the blood the, the mature vasculature, and uh, so it looks like the IPRGCs are very much linked to that to the you know to the the, the early blood vessels. Now, uh, whether they have an impact on uh, what I've told you about, maybe. Uh, that would be very interesting. Uh, it would be interesting to maybe to use a, a melanopsin knockout mouse and see whether, you know, there are clusters and, and, uh, uh, and what happens to, uh, you know, and how all these things are linked. I don't know. But that could be easily done, I guess. Yeah. Okay, well, th thank you very much again, Evelyn. So, um, as I said, we will now close this official part, but Evelyn, so please, uh, please yeah, don't yeah. disappear. Stay, stay. <laughs> and uh, so we will, um, so anyone who wants to can just jump into the Zoom now, and hopefully we'll close the actual video recording uh, so that what we say afterwards will not be recorded. That's the hope. Um, okay, so let's do that. Okay. Um, so everyone, please jump into the Zoom if you feel so inclined. I see something from Michael O'Donovan. Uh, oh, a super I, presentation, Evelyn, very interesting and provocative ideas. Do you see that? Do you know whether the metabolites of CNO are active on the vasculature? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> the hind limb uh, afferents, uh, 